The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is an immensely important international agreement that it's hard really to overstate its significance. We're going to look at UNCLOS in this lecture. It's, this is our sixth lecture and we're moving on from the marine pollution laws that we considered in the last lecture. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at UNCLOS because of its importance. And I'm going to break this lecture into two parts, but the, the second part is much smaller than the first part. The first part I really want to get into, unpack and understand maritime zones and particularly uh, the concepts around the exclusive economic zone because from an international environmental regulatory perspective, it's the exclusive economic zone that does, that's the really important zone to be aware of because it extends for 200 nautical miles out to sea from a coastline subject to some uh, complexities around countries that are closer together than 400 nautical miles. We'll talk about that. But uh, at least where you're facing an open ocean with more than 200 nautical miles or 400 nautical miles to your nearest neighbour, the exclusive ec economic zone can extend out for 200 nautical miles and within that you can con control fisheries and also oil and gas exploration. So very significant for any country that has a coastline. So we're going to talk about UNCLOS, the maritime jurisdictions, also talk briefly about land sourced marine pollution which is also regulated under UNCLOS, uh, deep sea mining I'll touch on and fisheries and we'll see with fisheries that UNCLOS is very good at regulating fisheries exploitation within maritime, national maritime zones but it's really bad, it's really weak on regulating things outside that on what are called the high seas. So areas beyond national jurisdiction are very difficult to regulate and so there's a whole range of regional treaties that deal with different fisheries. So we're going to look as an example of a regional uh, fisheries agreement or a specific fisheries agreement. We're going to look at the Convention on the Conservation of the Southern Bluefin Tuna which Australia and Japan are particularly involved in that fishery. Uh, I'll, I'll mention the uh, one other, the um, Convention for the Conservation and Management of Highly Migratory Fish Stocks in the Western and Central Pacifics. So that's what we're going to cover in outline. So the context of this lecture is uh, the 1980s to the, to the 1990s, so we've moved into a, a new period. Uh, previously we were looking at the, the period where the, the, those groundbreaking treaties in the 70s were uh, agreed to. Now we're moving into the 80s and I just want to summarise that this period in a, a few key points. First is that it's a period of ongoing growth and expansion in many parts of the world, so similar to the previous period. Government and public concern for the environment are heightened even beyond what it had been in the 60s and 70s by emerging global threats such as the discovery of the hole in the ozone layer. There's also the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986, which I just got an image here, you know the background to that. So in 1986, uh, a Russian uh, nuclear accident occurred and it's, it spewed a toxic plume over not only the surrounding area, but also over Europe. So uh, a terrible disaster and yeah, it was a really significant event. Uh, the, I think Russia originally didn't tell anyone about it, that there'd been this disaster. And in Sweden, they have some nuclear plants. And suddenly their meters started basically giving alerts that, that they thought that they had a nuclear leak in their own reactors. And they did, you know, really quick checking and they found there was nothing. And then gradually it was realized that it was coming from somewhere else. And then effectively it came out that there'd been this, this incredible disaster in um, the Ukraine. So there was a huge concern about the environment in these, these years, more, more so than now. And uh, in that context there was a famous report published by, uh, it's called the Brooklyn Repo Report, named after the uh, chair of the committee that wrote the report and it established sustainable development as a key international principle. So that's an important development in this period as well. And it's also a period of major 
geopolitical shift as the Soviet Union disintegrated and the Berlin Wall fell at the end of the decade. So that's the, this, the context for this. And UNCLOS occurs in this context. It had actually been, they've been negotiating it for about 10 years to get to the point it just happened to get across the line in this period. I love this quote from Gillian Triggs. I've mentioned her before. She's an Australian international lawyer, human rights uh, advocate, wonderful, wonderful person. And in a book she wrote in 2006 called International Law, Contemporary Principles and Practices, she, she begins her chapter on the law of the sea by, with this sentence, and I just love it. The international law of the sea ebbs and flows with the evolving geopolitical priorities of the age. And it's really apt. So let's look at UNCLOS. And I just give you some basics about UNCLOS, because UNCLOS is really big, and we're really focusing on the environmental aspects of it. So in terms of UNCLOS basics, a few dot points. So the first conference to negotiate the convention text was held in 1973. So remember, we've talked about creating and then administering treaties. And there's a negotiation period. Uh, so for a big, complex treaty like this, it took nearly a decade for the text to be agreed. It was signed at Montego Bay in Jamaica in 1982. It's been in force since 1994, so it took 12 years for it to come into force. There's currently 168 parties, and that doesn't include the United States of America. I've mentioned in earlier lectures that the US government wants to ratify it, but the US Senate refuses to allow it to allow the executive government to ratify it under the US system. So, yep, they haven't been able to ratify it. The, the US still claims that maritime zones equivalent with UNCLOS, it's, uh, but it does that on the basis of having the world's biggest navy rather than a, a legal basis for it. So the Secretariat for UNCLOS is at the UN in New York. Uh, the meetings of state parties to UNCLOS occur annually, the COPS, and there's a homepage for it. Um, I've given the link there, but you could just search for UNCLOS, you'll easily get the homepage. Okay, in terms of structure, it's big. It's 320 articles divided into 27 parts plus nine annexes. So I'm not gonna open it up and take us through it article by article. I just want to summarise the most important parts for environmental management in this way. So there's part two, which deals with the territorial sea and the contiguous zone. Part five deals with the exclusive economic zone. Part six deals with the continental shelf. Part seven deals with the high seas. Part 11 deals with the seabed and ocean floor, which very unhelpfully they call the area. Uh, so you see all these references in it to the area, and it's just so generic. They should have just called it the seabed or something, or the ocean floor would have been far more useful than the area. But anyway, part 11 deals with the area, the ocean, the seabed and ocean floor beyond national jurisdictions. And then part 12 deals with the protection and preservation of the marine environment. But part 12 doesn't occur in isolation. The maritime zones leading up to it are critical for the reality of trying to manage marine resources. So th those parts in total create a very, very important regime for management of fisheries and oil and gas within national waters. Now, I'm going to take you to look at those concepts, but I actually want to back up a bit and understand the context of this treaty and the regime it created in the context of what came before. And there's important historical background to maritime zones and fisheries management under UNCLOS. And I just want to mention or unpack customary international laws on international maritime jurisdictions. So uh, remember we've talked about the sources of international law. There can be treaties, which is the main source of modern international environmental laws, but also custom. So the lo customary law so the practice of states on the basis of being bound uh, is it also important in relation to some issues like sovereignty. Uh, there was customary international law around maritime zones as well, but it was very restrictive. The Bering Sea Fur Seals Arbitration in, 19, sorry, in 1893 is, a, is an important decision by an, an arbitration panel that basically 
identified what customary international law was at that time. So I want to just talk about the Bering Fur Seals arbitration. So the Bering Strait lies between Russia and Alaska. You can see it there marked on the, uh, that image. And the, <coughs> the dispute in the Bering Fur Seals arbitration involve the Pribilof Islands, which I've circled in red. And just as a bit of historic context, uh, the Bering Strait is named, named after Vitus Bering, who explored the area in, se and his second expedition was in 1741, uh, and was wrecked in the, in the area. Um, he died on Bering Island on his second voyage, probably from scurvy. And the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait are named after, were named after him by Captain James Cook on his third and final voyage um, in 1776. And so this is a painting of the terrible conditions. Can you just imagine like going there with no maps, with vessels that are completely under sail, so no engines or anything, uh, incredibly difficult conditions, strong currents, uh, incredible storms uh, and winds, extremely, extremely risky. Uh, uh, Victor Sparing went there, basically he was um, hired by the Russian Tsar to go and explore the area and claim it for Russia. And Russia had actually claimed Alaska and actually Alaska was part of Russia until, uh, I'll come to it, it was sold to the US. So this is a check so Russia in, oh, Russia with three S's, uh, a $7.2 million check from the US to Russia, or Razia, uh, to purchase Alaska in 1867. So that's the actual copy of the check. So basically, the, uh, as I understand it, the Russian Tsar was short of money and believed that they had taken all the fur, because in... 1860s, they were mainly interested in fur seals and those sorts of things and the like, and they thought that they had taken all of that from Alaska. This is prior to gold being discovered in Alaska, and obviously well prior to oil. Uh, so Russia sold Alaska to the US. So I didn't actually talk about, I gave you a handout about sovereignty and how sovereignty can be obtained. So sovereignty can be obtained in a number of ways. One on that handout was uh, terra nullius, so if it's land, if you find land that no one is there and it's land belonging to no one, you can claim it and then if you occupy it and you establish effective occupation, it becomes part of your territory. Uh, you can, prior to the UN Charter, you could also conquer. You can't do that anymore. It's Technically it's outlawed, but Russia obviously has just invaded the Ukraine and annexed part of the Ukraine. So. Um, Sovereignty by conquest is outlawed on paper, uh, but there's exceptions happening around the world um, uh, to that. But, but basically, you, at least in theory, you can't obtain territory by conquering your neighbours. Uh, another way that you can gain territory, though, is to just buy it. And this was what uh, the US did to gain Alaska. It bought it off Russia. And so Russia ceded its territory and sold it. So uh, anyway, those are listed on the handout. Uh, yeah. So at the time, uh, the US Secretary of State who negotiated it was heavily criticised in the US press. So uh, he, uh, the New York, one New York newspaper called Alaska a sucked orange, saying Russia had already drained all value out of it. The purchase was known as Seawood's Folly or Seawood's Icebox after the Secretary of State, William Seawood. And ironically, selling Alaska today would fetch around 2.5 trillion. So it's obviously paid for itself quite a few times over. So soon after the US bought it, gold was discovered there. And obviously now it's got oil and gas uh, developments plus its strategic value. So a bit of background. So when the US bought Alaska. It also um, bought the islands in the Bering Sea, including the Privilof Islands. 
So this is a few pictures of the Pribilof Highlands. Uh, and you can see they're fairly windswept and barren, be very cold and wet. Um, what you can see in the distance is a, a fur seal rookery on St George Island. And the architecture's got a very Russian flavour because it, it was essentially originally settled by Russians and then it was sold to the US but it still had a lot of Russian culture. And here's a fur seal, alive and well and uh, looking pretty unhappy. And here's a fur seal rookery. So in the 1800s, uh, fur seals were extensively hunted and this is an illustration looking down on one of those islands with fur seals in the distance and then here's uh, some illustrations showing uh, you can see in the top right going out and looking and harp, you know just harpooning seals in the top left the fur seals being hung up uh, and then um, for meat here's a clubbing a killing gang at work so they'd go out and just club them to death and then they're after the meat and the, um, and the furs. And here's a catching fur seal skin. So I, as I understand it, that's basically you cure it. And then I think that they were turned into jackets and things at the time. So, so they were extensively hunted. And it got to the point where the US, uh, the Privilof Islands, they're often called the fur seal islands. It got to the point where the US was concerned about the conservation of the fur seals and they tried to take action to stop or, or to restrict the culling of the fur seals. And that led to the arbitration because they, would try, they tried to not only regulate the fur seals when they're on land, but also when they left the islands and swam out into the ocean. And when they got out there, vessels from other countries, particularly from Canada uh, would, and Russia, would um, kill them when they're out in the water. And the US basically claimed that they had jurisdiction over the fur seals because they came from their islands, even though even when they went out into the water. So basically, the tribunal or the arbitration panel um, proposed as part of its judgment a number of measures for a conservation plan about how they could be better managed. It proposed a prohibited zone within which fur seals couldn't be killed a closed season in a defined area of the high seas with exceptions for indigenous hunting. It proposed limitation on the type of vessels that could be used. It proposed a licensing system for seal hunting, proposed the use of a special flag while sealing, uh, keeping of catch records, seven, exchange of data collected, eight, government responsibility for choice of suitable crews, and nine, a plan to be enacted into national uniform laws in the US and Britain to ensure enforcement. So, and a three year ban or moratorium on all sealing. Now, if you look at that list, that wouldn't be out of place in a modern marine park plan. So this was absolutely groundbreaking for the time. This is really what's become the foundation for a lot of marine park management. So this decision is, is really important. Um, however, like a lot of marine park management, it failed. Um, basically, um, the arbitration was between uh, British Canadian vessels and the US, and those vessels then, so they were flagged in the US and in Canada, and when the US and Canada brought in these more rest restrictions on killing fur seals, the vessels just left and re-registered in Japan and other countries to avoid being subject to US and Canadian laws. And the seal. So that's an example of the flag state jurisdiction. So they just basically take the vessel, go and register in another country, and you're no longer subject to the laws of the previous country. So the seal population continued to decline until inter an international agreement between all nations involved in the sealing was signed in 1911, the Convention on Bering Sea Fur Seals. So I've just taken that description from a textbook by Bernie and Boyle on international law and the environment. So that um, decision is a really important one in the evolution of marine prote protected areas and fisheries management globally. And as part of that arbitration, it was held that the US jurisdiction extended only to three nautical miles. So that's in 1893, and that's been extended since then. 
Does anyone know why um, it was three nautical miles? It's quite famous why it was that, why it was three nautical miles. Yes. That's right. It was the length that a cannon could fire. I don't think it was at that time. I think it was in the 1700s, like a century or two before. So in the, say, 16 and 1700s, the major naval powers of the time, so the United Kingdom and France and Spain, their interest was in minimising national waters. So they wanted their fleets to be able to go anywhere unhindered and their vessels to go anywhere unhindered and they didn't want to be subject to other countries' laws. So the law at that time was national waters only extended to three nautical miles and the rationale at the time was that was as far as, far as a cannon could fire from land. So it was as far as the sea could be controlled from the land. So that's where three nautical miles originally comes from. And then in 1972, in the Icelandic fisheries cases, it was extended, it, it was recognised that customary international law had evolved and it was now 12 nautical miles. But then UNCLOS came along in 1982 and through the treaty extended it to 200 nautical miles. So that's how we get to the modern framework for maritime zones under parts two to seven of UNCLOS. And I've given you this on a handout. So can you grab out that handout? So this is a great little uh, diagram that comes from a, a book, or comes from, I think, the originally the Arctic Council in 2009. Can I just point out, um, you can see on it one nautical mile. So a nautical mile is not you know, an imperial mile of, what is it, a mile is 1,600 metres in. So most of us work in kilometres. And then the US still works in um, miles, doesn't it, generally? Uh, which is 1,600 metres, isn't it? A mile, 1,600 metres. Uh, and a nautical mile is different. It's 1,852 metres. Now, does anyone know why that is the distance of a nautical mile. Again, there's history to this. Uh, it actually comes from the time when ships used to navigate using sextants and um, stars and the like. Um, effectively, 1,852 metres is equivalent to one meridian at the equator. So it was a unit that was used in when they were basically sailing and using meridians and the like for location. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't someone just didn't come up with one, 1,852, you know, just thinking of a difficult number to remember. It was actually came from a, an, old, an old system that when we translate it into metres becomes 1,852. So when we talk about nautical miles, I mean, you talk about, it's significant because 200 nautical miles effectively translates into about 360 kilometres. So it's a lot more than 200, it's nearly double. So uh, the exclusive economic zone is the really important one. But you can see there, um, there's the baseline, um, territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, and then the high seas, which is an area beyond maritime waters, sorry, the um, exclusive economic zone. Um, importantly, you don't go with the territorial sea out to 12 nautical miles and then add 200 nautical miles. Everything goes from the baseline, which is generally the low water mark, marked on um, large scale um, navigational charts. So uh, it's 200 nautical miles from the baseline and then the high seas is the area beyond that. The continental shelf uh, can extend out beyond that, and, or it might not. So the continental shelf that goes out from a coastline and when it, where it drops down, it might be within 200 nautical miles. If it goes out beyond 200 nautical miles, then there are certain rights over the continental shelf. So that might go beyond 200 nautical miles out to an absolute limit of 350 nautical miles. So. 
uh, and beyond that um, area is called the area, and so that's the seabed um, where it's administered by the International Seabed Authority. As I understand it, that's one of the reasons why the US Senate refuses to ratify or to authorise ratification of UNCLOS is because they hate the idea of uh, US corporations and US activities being subject to the International Seabed Authority, so for deep sea mining and those sorts of things. But I don't, I mean, I don't really understand what the hang-up is beyond an ideological uh, and political opposition to you know, the United Nations within the US Senate. So um, let's unpack that a bit. Uh, so it all looks, you know, that looks all well and good when you look at it sideways and it's in a nice diagram. Let's look at it in the, the messiness of the real world. So I've shown you this map before when we we're talking about the Antarctic Treaty and whaling. So the significance of UNCLOS for coastal states just is hard to understate. So for a country like Australia, all of those mustard areas, so if you have sovereignty over land, then you can claim a maritime zone. So even for those small islands off the, the northwest of Australia, that island then gives you an immense area of fisheries and oil and gas that you can control. And then for a massive country like Australia with a huge coastline, the area of maritime zones is, you know, equivalent in the order of the entire landmass. So it's incredibly valuable. And so within that mustard area, Australia can control fisheries and also control oil and gas development. And then you can see, see the area going off to the northwest, that blue, light blue up here. See that? So that's an area of the continental shelf um, that, has ex that extends out in that region. But, uh, and there's a continental shelf, say, coming down here um, from Tasmania and it, um, a bit off the east coast as well. But not all areas, the continental, in, it's not in all areas that the continental shelf goes beyond that. So, for instance, um, you know, in this area, obviously the continental shelf doesn't go beyond the 200 nautical mile EZ, or actually even, in, that's probably not the best example because it, um, it, it's more limited there than... Um, than 200 nautic miles. Um, anyway, that bottom, the central point there is the, the uh, continental shelf can go beyond 200 nautic miles, but it might not. Okay, so if we focus in, and I've given you this on the handout as well, so on the flip side of the handout, looking at what those maritime zones actually translate to in practice. So the mustard is the exclusive economic zone. And you notice it jumps out around islands. So this whole area is within the exclusive economic zone. But notice up here where it, we're coming close to Papua New Guinea and these areas here where it's chopped. So if you are closer than 400 nautical miles to the territory of another state, then effectively you divide it in two. It's called the line of equidistance and you divide the space between you in two. So you might not between Australia and Papua New Guinea, um, so they're just your maritime zones, I've given you that in your handout as well. And this is another diagram showing in sort of perfect form how it might jump out. Um, can I just draw your attention here to the baselines? So the baselines, there's complicated rules in UNCLOS that we don't need to worry about because cartographers and um, basically naval yeah, cartographers prepare nautical maps that show the baseline. So you can just go and get a map, uh, like the map that I've given you. Uh, and you know, an official map, you can identify where the baseline is. And so if you're a ship, you can just use one of those maps to work out wh whether you're within the maritime zone of a, of a country or not. But the rules in UNCLOS, basically, it's not just following the low water mark. You can go out around uh, islands, so there's rules for when you can draw a straight baseline. And notice here there's a bay. So you can draw a sta straight baseline across bays, but there's rules for when you can and when you can't. Uh, and then there's an island. You can see it jumps out. You've got, so the coastal waters is the three nautical miles. The territorial sea 
is 12 nautical miles. The contiguous zone is 24 nautical miles. The contiguous zone is important for uh, customs particularly. Vessels within your contiguous zone, it gives a coastal state greater ability to board them and to search them for customs related things. Um, but it's the exclusive economic zone, jumping up to 200 nautical miles, the coastal state can then regulate um, fisheries within that. And so you can see here the continental shelf is shown as extending out that full way. So if we use a, a real example of Brisbane, what that might look like. So if we look at Brisbane, uh, we're here, and you can see here this is a um, just basically focusing in on the map I've given you. But see, there's North Strabrick Island. So, so we've got North Strabrick Island here and then Morton Island. So these two massive islands. And basically the baseline goes out and around them. So if you are on Morton Bay, you are within Australia's and Queensland's coastal waters. Once you go out beyond um, you know, the other side of those islands, that's where the baseline starts from. So I just want to also explain the difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights. It can be quite confusing, but I can, can I explain it in this way? Um, can you put your hand up if you are living in a house or a unit that you actually own? Okay, so that's about 40% of us. So uh, put your hand up if you're renting at the moment. Okay, so that's everyone else. Uh, so sovereignty is like owning a house. You actually own it. So like Australia has sovereignty over the Australian landmass, we actually own it. We can you know, pretty well do what we want to it because it's ours. Sovereign rights is a bit like a lease. So like if you're leasing a unit or a house, you have a right to occupy it under the lease, but you don't actually own it. It's owned by somebody else, but you've got rights to go and use the property. And you've also got a right to exclude even the owner because under, if they're not entering under the terms of your lease, you've got a right to peaceful possession. So UNCLOS basically built upon the, the idea of sovereignty over land and coastal waters and the territorial sea, which it was accepted that there was sovereignty over those areas. And then what it did was basically create these rights, which it called sovereign rights, which are based upon owning the land and the adjacent coastal waters and territorial sea. And so beyond the territorial sea, countries have sovereign rights, but they don't actually have sovereignty. So they don't actually own those areas, but they have rights to control them. The idea of sovereign rights and comparing it to like renting a property breaks down in the sense that there's then no owner of those areas as such. But I just wanted to try and explain in a, in a set of legal rights that you're broadly familiar with uh, the difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights because otherwise it's just really confusing. You can just sort of get thinking, well, what is this? What is the difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights? In practice, there's very little real difference, um, but they're two terms that are used in UNCLOS. So if we look at uh, a few provisions of UNCLOS to actually see how it defines those things, the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, the sovereignty of, coastal, the sovereignty of a coastal state extends beyond its land territory and internal waters, and in the case of an archipelagic state, so that's a, a country consisting of islands, like Indonesia is made up of a lot of islands, so it's an uh, archi archipelagic state. Um, it's archi archipelagic waters uh, to an adjacent belt of sea described as the territorial sea. This sovereignty extends to the airspace over the territorial sea as well as its bed and subsoil. So that's sovereignty. It's like full ownership. And then obviously you can make laws and control vessels within that space. So that's really the most powerful set of rights you've got. And if a vessel comes into that area, you can board it. It doesn't matter who it's flagged with. It's within your jurisdiction. And so it's subject to your laws. So the breadth of the territorial sea extends for 12 nautical miles. 
out from the baseline and we talked about baselines. So article, as I said, they're, they're defined um, in UNCLOS and just as a few of the provisions. Article 5, the normal baseline, except where otherwise provided in this convention, the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water line along the coast is marked on large scale charts, officially recognised by the coastal state. And then reefs. In the case of islands situated on atolls or of islands having fringing reefs, the baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the seaward low water line of the reef. And then straight baselines um, in localities where the coastline is deeply indented or cut into, or if there is a fringe islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity, the method of straight baselines joining appropriate points may be employed in drawing the baseline, etc. So that's the baseline. We, didn't need, we don't need to worry about the, the technicalities. You just can look at a map like I've given you. So that's the territorial sea. Then we move to the EZ, the exclusive economic zone. And this is the maritime zone that I really want you to be aware of for the purposes of our course, because it's the most important. So the exclusive economic zone is an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea, subject to the specific legal regime established in this part, under which the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state and the rights and freedoms of other states are governed by the relevant provisions of this convention. And in the EEZ, the coastal state has sovereign rights. So notice that change in terminology. It's no longer sovereignty. It talks about sovereign rights for the purposes of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources, etc. The breadth of it is 200 nautical miles from the baseline. So again, I'd emphasize it's not 200 miles from the extent of the, the territorial sea. So it's not 212 miles, it's 200 miles from the baseline. So the EZ just basically extends over the top of it. And the continental shelf uh, is the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond its territorial sea through the nat natural prolongation of its land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured where the outer edge of the continental margin does not extend up to that distance. So yeah, that's basically equivalent to the EZ, but it can also go out to a maximum limit of 350 nautical miles. So rights of the coastal state over the continental shelf, basically you've got the right to exploit the natural resources, um, but not the, of, the, of the actual bottom of the ocean, not the waters above it. So the rights of the coastal state over the continental shelf do not affect the legal status of the super adjacent waters of the airspace above those waters. So the continental shelf, countries can control oil and gas drilling on the seafloor but they can't control fishing in the water above the seafloor. That's why the EZ is so important, because in the EZ, you can actually control fishing in the water above the seafloor. OK, drilling on the continental shelf. The coastal state shall have the exclusive right to authorise and regulate drilling, so oil and gas. So what happens if the EZ of neighbouring countries is within 400 nautical miles of each other? So we're going to look at the Torres Strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea as an example. So if we focus in there, it's very narrow. It's far less than 400 nautical miles. In fact, uh, effectively, um, there's a special treaty, the Torres Strait Treaty between Australia and Papua New Guinea about that region. Um, but under UNCLOS, you can see the lines drawn in there. Uh, there's, n there's no EZ because there's higher levels of rights um, you can see basically a lot of coastal waters in that in the blue the baseline goes out quite a bit past Cape York and then there's all those islands and then the purple is the territorial sea so um, yeah you can see that two closely neighboring countries you don't necessarily get an EZ um, that's just another version of that same sort of diagram so how is the maritime boundary determined when adjacent countries have winding coastlines? And um, basically, it's called the line of equidistance. So where the coasts of two states are opposite or adjacent to each other, neither of the two states is entitled filing agreement between them to the country to extend its territorial sea beyond the median line, every point of which is equidistance from the nearest points on the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial seas 
of each of the two states is measure, measured. So that sounds really complicated and I want to give you a couple of examples of resolving that. So there's provisions in UNCLOS for re resolving disputes which countries can submit to and there have been a number of cases that have gone before the International Court of Justice for, for precisely this reason. Countries resolving disputes about uh, their maritime zones. So the ICJ have mentioned in the past in, in previous lectures about um, international whaling and here's a picture of uh, lawyers appearing before the 15 members of the ICJ and yeah picture from 2006 you can see the judges there and lawyers appearing before them. So here's an example of one of the cases that was resolved. Uh, this is this was a dispute between involving the Black Sea between um, so here's the catchment of the Black Sea and it was a dispute between the Ukraine and Romania so if you see, can you see on that map, see Romania is, here's Romania and here's the Ukraine, whoops. So Romania is claiming the red line and Ukraine is claiming that it's the, the proper boundary is the blue line. So the red line gives who the most? Romania. So it's pretty obvious why Romania wants that line and similarly for the blue it gives a lot more of the Black Sea to the Ukraine so it can then control fisheries and oil and gas within that area so it wants the blue line. So that is a, there's a dispute and it's not obvious where the line should go is it? Like because you know you've got this winding coastline it's not simple um, the ICJ, that's the line that the ICJ came up with, the, the equidistance point from all of the relevant baselines. And if you go back, it's almost like they've split the difference, but it's not like, what's that famous story of some king that, to, to King Solomon with, you know, was it two mothers um, claim, ch um, claiming that they were the mother of a child and King Solomon said, cut the child in two and give half to each. Um, but the child didn't get hurt. Um, I think the, the real mother then gave it up. Well, that's the moral of that story. Anyway, King Solomon, in terms of cutting it in two, the ICJ just hasn't sort of cut the two claims in two. Uh, a logical reason why, can you think of a logical reason why the actual line might go down the middle of what they were claiming? Because both going into it probably had an idea that that was where the line was and they've tried to maximise their positions but you don't go too far beyond what you think you can possibly get away with. You often claim a little bit more than you think you'll get. Uh, so the fact that the ICJ came up with a line down the middle doesn't necessarily reflect that the ICJ was just splitting the two cases. It probably reflects the starting positions of the two countries went a bit beyond what each of them thought they would get. Okay, another example. This was very contentious uh, between Nicaragua and Colombia. Uh, it took 11 years before the ICJ and so it drew outrage in the countries and, and yep, they've been odd, at odds at, over it for years. Um, and yeah, no, Nicaragua rejected, anyway. Here was the Nicaragua's claim. Okay, so Nicaragua is over here and Colombia is over here. So this is Nicaragua's claim and this is Colombia's claim for where um, the line should be drawn. So obviously that gives a lot more to Nicaragua in terms of the yellow and this gives a lot more to Colombia, the lack of yellow. So those were the two options uh, and this is what the ICJ um, identified and it's actually more complicated than just the equidistance lines. There was a whole heap of treaties, historic agreements between the two countries that led to um, the ruling. So uh, it can be really complex, it can have more than just UNCLOS involved uh, but yeah, important to have a sort of dispute resolution mechanism. 
Okay, another, uh, I think the final case I just look at is Peru and Chile, maritime dispute in 2014. So Peru and Chile, they're on the map. So there's this inflection in the coastline, Peru obviously to the north, and Chile to the south. And so the blue line was what Chile was claiming and the red line was what Peru was claiming. So obviously we're in a similar situation to the Ukraine and Romania. The red line would, Peru's claiming the red line because it would give it a lot more area and Chile is claiming the blue line because it would give it a lot more area. And the ICJ went almost down the middle. Um, and here's, I think, an interesting, this was actually included in the ICJ judgment. So this is the construction of the equidistance line. So you can see there how they worked out the line. It was the point equidistance but from the relevant baselines. And you can see there that actually that makes sense when you draw it in that way. So it didn't give either of them quite what they wanted, uh, but the fact that it was just split down the middle doesn't necessarily reflect that the ICJ was just doing the, the sort of path of least resistance. It's, in this case, it looks like it's the right um, line. So those are some disputes that have been resolved by peaceful means, but not all disputes are resolved in that way. And sometimes countries just refuse to submit to an international forum to resolve disputes. And the classic ones at the moment uh, I mentioned the Senkaku Island dispute between China and Japan and um, Taiwan, and also China's U-shaped claim in the South China Sea is the really famous one that's been in the news for the last five years particularly. So just to recap on the Senkaku Islands, I mentioned that briefly in relation to uh, the UN Charter. Uh, so these are islands that are claimed by Japan, uh, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China. So can I just say mainland China and Taiwan? And um, I, I explained the history to them that um, uh, they would have been part of China probably up until the 1890s. And then when Japan was a major industrialized and became a major military power in the 1880s, 1890s, and opened up and industrialized, uh, and uh, Japan conquered them in the 1890s. And so they were part of Japanese territory up until the end of World War II. And then they were recognized as belonging to Japan by the US government uh, in the peace treaty. Uh, China, mainland China and Taiwan dispute that territory. Um, as I said in the earlier lecture, my view is Japan has the strongest legal claim, but that doesn't mean it's you know, necessary. I'm just talking there as a lawyer. I think Japan has the strongest legal claim to it, but there's no way China or Taiwan are going to accept that um, for political reasons. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, historical baggage between China and Japan um, where they've fought wars over centuries and um, so a lot of cultural baggage between the two. Um, and for Japan, it becomes you know, a matter of national pride and similarly for China, matters of national pride. So what might be a legally correct decision isn't necessarily what countries will do. So these um, islands, this is just some pictures of them. Here's a Japanese patrol vessel in front of them. And as I said in an earlier lecture, there was real concerns um, a few years ago that it would lead to armed conflict between Japan and mainland China. But I don't want to dwell on that one because it's really, you, you rarely hear about it in the news uh, at the moment. The much greater concern since about 2013, 2014 has been China's uh, U-shaped claim in the South China Sea. So, and it's, I just mentioned it's different to the Senkaku Islands, it's a different dispute. So this U-shaped claim is based upon a map, a rough map that China uses based on nine, it's called the nine dash line. And it basically is as simple as this, uh, nine dashes. And you notice there, there's the Philippines, so China up here, and Vietnam here, and the Philippines here, um, and Brunei and Malaysia here. 
Notice that this red line here, so China's claiming everything within this U. Notice that the red line almost comes down and touches the coast of Malaysia. Like, and it is a long, long way from the Chinese mainland. Um, there are some islands along the way that China claims um, as establishing, sort of giving it that ability to have this sort of big tongue coming down. But it's a really amb ambitious, I'll use that um, as a lawyer would, this is an ambitious claim, Your Honour, which is secretly scolding it, saying this is just nuts. Um, it, legally, it's, it is a pretty outrageously um, unbelievable claim. But um, it's made by a massive superpower now and backed by you know, it and its forces. So uh, it needs to be taken seriously. So uh, within this area, it's a, obviously a major um, route for international shipping uh, coming from uh, not only China, but also Korea and Japan. Uh, so huge amount of uh, trade goes through those waters. Uh, if you look at the Chinese claim, so moved on from the nine dash line and just sort of joined it together in a, a line, and then you overlay it with um, what m would be claims by other countries. So here's the Philippines claim to waters. Here's the Vietnamese claim. Uh, and Brunei coming straight out. And see China cuts through all of them, including Malaysia's claim down here. So. Obviously, simply between the Philippines and Vietnam, there is a big dispute um, simply over their um, jurisdiction. And it's complicated by some islands in between, so it's not just separating between the two sort of mainlands of the two countries, but China's claim that comes down in the U-shape, you know, cuts across all of those. Um, and here's a if you just if you ignored the islands, I think this map does, and just went out 200 nautical miles from like the Philippines' main islands and Vietnam's coastline, and ignored any islands along the way, you'd end up with a gap in the middle, and the U-shape came comes down all the way around that again, almost touches the coastline of Malaysia, and within that area, there's a whole number of reefs and small islands. And uh, for decades, the different countries have fought over those islands. In fact, um, Vietnam and uh, China fought a um, small-scale war over one of the islands in, I think it's listed on one of these slides, and there was, there was a dozen or so Vietnamese sailors killed when China took it off Vietnam. And Vietnam has been, you know, incensed about that ever since. So um, this is a photo of uh, Chinese boats being chased after illegal, illegal, sorry, alleged illegal fishing in South Korean waters. So in the Yellow Sea, um, there's a whole heap. If you want to go and look at South China Sea and dispute, there's a whole heap of news about it. I've got a few slides where I'll show you the development of it. But basically, since 2013-2014 and the international context of this was it was the second term of Barack Obama and he was widely regarded as a very weak president internationally so he had you know was trying to pull troops back out of Afghanistan and extract the US from overseas wars so he had a very low appetite for getting involved in and essentially what appears to have happened is that China recognised an opportunity and took it to establish military bases all through the area. So um, China started building on top of reefs, started building artificial islands to, and then basically putting airstrips on them and arming them. So here was a design of one of the planned bases. This was from 2014 in the Philippine Star, and this is what that base actually looks like now. So it was a reef, there was no island there. So they dredged up a whole heap of sand, dumped it on the top of the reef, and then basically built um, a military base on top of it. So that's Johnson Reef. So that's where it's located between the Philippines and Vietnam in the Spratly Islands. And so here's some outposts. So the red spots are Vietnamese outposts, the green spots are Chinese, 
the little pink one there is the, a Taiwanese outpost. Uh, yellow are Malaysian and blue are the Philippines. And so, yep. Sorry, why wouldn't they? Are they? The simple answer is no, uh, because essentially of the military power of China now. And I think also with the Philippines, they've, China's been able to bribe or buy the current de deterrents. So the previous government of the Philippines was incensed by China's actions, but the current president um, wants China's business, so basically has caved in to it. So. It's a pretty, yeah. But it go, there's decades of sort of the development to this point. It's only really been, though, in the last few years where China has moved really aggressively to build artificial islands. So um, I'm going to show you some images of Mbini or Johnson South Reef in the Philippines EZ. So, um, oh, sorry, that was the last one, was it? I think I've got a picture of Mbini in a moment. Anyway. Um, China's, this is just a comment from 2014 I thought was really apt. China's island building is aimed at addressing a serious deficit. Other countries that claim large chunks of the South China Sea, Vietnam, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, all control real islands. But China came very late to this party and missed out on all the good real estate. So countries were claiming these really after World War II. And if you think of China at that point, it had just gone through this, its civil war. Uh, and yeah, it wasn't... It wasn't the China, you know, modern China. It was very early stages when countries were claiming, you know, when the dust was settling after World War II, the Japanese had been pushed back, um, the US was still there, but these countries, what, what were sorting out sort of terri territorial disputes, they, con they controlled all the real islands. Uh, and, yeah, Beijing only took control of Johnson South Reef in 1988 after a bloody battle with Vietnam. Think about that, so... Uh, China and Vietnamese, Vietnam, both communist countries, so both, you know, f fought together in the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, China supplied uh, Vietnamese forces with um, arms. And, yeah, here they are having a war, or a small-scale war. Seventy Vietnamese sailors were killed in it, and Hanoi has never forgiven Beijing. Since then, China has shied away from direct military confrontation. Um, but now Beijing has decided it's time to move. So this is 2014, so a few years ago and to assert its claim and to back it up by creating new facts on the ground, a string of island bases and an unsinkable aircraft carrier right in the middle of the South China Sea. Uh, Manila knows it has no hope of standing up to Beijing in a straight fight, so the Philippines has taken its case to the United Nations. This is before um, Duterte's, is that how you say his name? The Duterte's, D Duterte's. Um, so the previous government of the Philippines took Beijing to the United Nations uh, under the UNCLOS um, and what China did, because pretty clearly it had no legal basis, the Philippines was going to win, so China's um, response was to ignore it and to claim that it was invalid. And so China didn't show up and the Philippines won. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Again, this is a comment from 2014, but I still think it's apt. China is just at the start of its rise as a naval power. The speed of the change is breathtaking. Right now, China is building new naval ships and submarines faster than any other country in the world, including the US. Second naval carrier is on the way, etc. And basically, the South China Sea is an expression of China's intent, and Beijing's ambition is to dominate the sea space within the first island chain. And in the longer term, it wants to move further beyond the Philippines and southern Japan to a second island chain to Palau, Guam, and the northern uh, Mariana Islands. So this is the two lines that were in part of that report. So basically, China is planning for its own defence and its control of its region. The first island chain is that red line, and you can see the U-shaped claim as part of that, and then a broader um, asserting and pushing back US influence in that area. So, um, OK, so there's a just some photos about the reefs. Um, so here's a good quote. You can see that this is a meth methodical, well-planned campaign to create a chain of air and sea capable fortresses across the centre of the Spratly Islands. So here's an image of the same island uh, at Gavin, well, it actually wasn't an island, it was a reef, Gavin Reef in the Spratly Islands. So the image on the left is in 30th of March, 2014. The image in the middle is the 7th of August, 2014. 
and then the image on the right is the 30th of January 2015. So you've taken a reef and you've turned it into a artificial island with a um, deeper port area. And this is what it looks like, Gavin Reef uh, in 2017. So you can see it was gone, it's changed from a coral reef into a military base. And similarly, Fire Reef, comparison between 2006 when it was a reef and then 2015 when it was turned into, into a military base. And that's it um, taken from a, um, a plane. Uh, yeah, so no longer a reef, now a military base. Uh, and similarly, yeah, that's just some of the, the dredges at, at work building the artificial islands. There's just more images of them. So 2017. So essentially China's been successful in establishing all these bases. They took the opportunity when Barack Obama was particularly weak and the US wouldn't push back because the US was the only country really that could have stopped them. The Philippines and all the others are too small. So uh, essentially took the opportunity um, and created new facts on the ground and they're there now. There's, they're not going to be, you can't sink them. They're not, you know, there's no way of getting um, those reefs back, they're effectively now been turned into fortresses. So yeah, that's another one of the reefs in 2014. And that's it in 2017. So you can see there are big building on it, radars, um, helipads, etc. Me, I'm all powerful. I can... <laughs> No, so so uh, effectively, China's you know will never submit to like the arbitration of the ter these territories. Will never submit it to a international court because why would you? You're a superpower and you've got all this military might. Why do you need to basically go for a ruling before an international court? Where if you actually apply the law, you're going to lose. So if you're the biggest bully on the block and there's no one that's gonna come and pull you, pull you up, then why do you need to obey the rules? And it, you know, China, I'll get to some quotes in a minute where you know, Chinese um, writers talk about, well, the US has done this for a long time, the US continues to do it. I mean, if you look at Israel, Israel has occupied the West Bank um, and you know, basically annexed territory. Russia is doing it in the Ukraine. Why can't China do it? It hasn't, at this stage, led to any armed conflict. So, and it's just basically turned some reefs into some military bases. Um, yeah, so you can see that these are extensive. This isn't just like a little platform on a, on a, on a reef. These are full-scale small cities that have been built with um, facilities and, you know, and military. This is some of the, the um, naval ships uh, at this particular base uh, in 2018. So anyway, I could go on with, you can see that I've, I'm really interested in that whole issue and the pictures of it, but it, you get the flavour. It is a big deal what has been done there. So uh, if we actually look at the law, what's the legal status of them? Uh, so within an EEZ, the coastal state shall have the exclusive right to construct and authorise and regulate the construction and operation and use of artificial islands. So these were within the EEZ of the Philippines. So the Philippines didn't authorise them. Um, and under paragraph 8 of Article 60, artificial islands, installations and structures do not possess the status of islands. They have no territorial sea of their own and their presence does not affect the delimination the, the of the territorial sea, the EEZ or the continental shelf. So under UNCLOS, there's no legal status for them. China hasn't actually gained anything legally. It doesn't have an EEZ. But the reality is very different. You know, if the Chinese Navy is there uh, and is going to push back to, you know, any, say, Philippines fishing vessels coming into the area and just allow Chinese vessels to fish them, then the de facto um, reality is it's basically Chinese waters and controlled by them. Okay. Uh, if the artificial islands, if they had been on the high seas, it could have potentially been lawful, but they're not on the high seas. Um, so there's, yeah, competing claims to the uh, continental shelves under the South China Sea. Um, yeah. 
as a little aside, what's an island? An island is a naturally formed area of land surrounded by water, which is above water at high tide. Um, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no EZ or continental shelf. So there's a, it sounds like a funny argument, but it's actually really significant under the law of the sea, the difference between an island and a rock. Uh, and a rock, yeah, it doesn't attract an EZ, um, but an island does. Okay, um, the reclamation would technically do little to bolster China's claim to the islands under UNCLOS because these have to be based on naturally occurring features. That said, if China's on the ground and is heavily armed, then it's going to be nigh on impossible for anyone to challenge or remove it. So international law is moot on this one. That was just a comment from James Hardy. Okay, so Philippines, under the previous government, took China um, to um, arbitration under UNCLOS, and you can see there the um, arbitration in progress. On the left is the Philippines legal team, and on the right is the Chinese legal team. No joke, uh, there is no legal team there. China refused to show up. They said they claimed that the arbitration had no legal basis, and basically, yeah. And clearly they did that because they knew they were going to lose. The Philippines won. It was a resounding victory legally. But, yeah, basically doesn't make any difference factually. So uh, this, I think, is a really, it was a really interesting article from 2014. It talked about lawfare um, and talked about it was a report from the US Secretary of Defense about three forms of warfare. And I think this is, this is really... Uh, in terms of being aware of it, it's not just China, but also Russia um, and other countries using um, various forms of, um, yeah, to disrupt um, their, if we don't say enemies, their competitors. So psychological warfare seeks to influence and disrupt an opponent's decision-making capability. So putting a crazy person in charge of another country, i.e. Russia, i.e. 2006, um, U.S. elections um, traumatized the whole country. Media warfare, um, so constant ongoing activity aimed at long-term influence or perceptions and attitudes. And also legal warfare, exploits the legal system to achieve political commercial activity. So a range of different activities that countries like Russia uh, and China engage in. Um, so just to wrap up UNCLOS, uh, I mentioned before that the US hasn't ratified UNCLOS. Um, it still claims a 200 nautical mile EZ, just there's not really a legal basis for that. The legal basis is that they've got the world's biggest navy. Uh, back in 2012, when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State, this is her and the um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and um, uh, the Defence Secretary basically going before the US Senate to plead for the US Senate to authorise the US ratifying UNCLOS because the US military was saying, well, you know, we're trying to defend um, rights in the South China Sea. And China's response is, well, you're not even a party to the treaty. So don't try and assert rights that you're not even entitled to claim. Um, so as part of the South China Sea dispute, the US military sort of renewed its push to be, become a party to UNCLOS, and anyway, the Senate knocked it back. Okay, China fairly sees double standards being applied to the US um, when it has ignored international law. And this is just a quote um, from a few years ago. Some of the brightest young scholars in China take great delight in reeling off the exhaustive, exhaustive examples of United States duplicity and double standards when the US has taken no notice of international law, never mind norms. United States actions have not been constrained by the international community in part because of its uh, hegemonic position, the argument goes, but in part because there was precious little anyone could do to stop them acting unilaterally. George Bush is the much invoked case in point, so the invasion of um, Iraq, um, which wasn't authorised by a Security Council resolution and wasn't in self-defence, so it was clearly in breach of international law. Um, but Whatever the merits of such arguments, one lesson seems to have been taken to heart. Great and powerful countries may not be able to do anything, may not be able to do anything they want, but they can do a lot more than weak ones. And it's precisely because China has become so much more materially consequential 
both militarily and economically, that its leaders clearly feel they can take more calculated risks. And building those artificial islands to bolster its territorial ambitions in the South China Sea is clearly that, a calculated risk. They weighed up, will the US intervene? And as I said, Barack Obama was really weak internationally at the time. And they took that opportunity and then took the calculated risk and now the facts have changed in terms of, you know, those things have been built now and they're not going away. Okay, so that's UNCLOS and maritime zones. Um, gone past an hour, it's an hour and a quarter. Why don't we get up and I'll take a break, take 10 minutes, we'll come back and we'll talk about marine pollution under UNCLOS and land source marine pollution. Okay, let's come back and keep going with our lecture on UNCLOS. So before... Before the break, we were talking about maritime zones and I've given you that handout with the major maritimes shown in diagram and then the map uh, out from the coast of Australia. Obviously, you don't need to worry about the details for the purposes of our course. I hope that that was interesting in terms of, uh, yeah, this really important area of international law and how countries then get to regulate surrounding areas. You don't need to know the detail for you know, the purpose of the exam. The main thing I want you to be aware of is the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf and the rights that are associated with them. So obviously the EZ you can extends for 200 nautical miles and countries can regulate fisheries within that including vessels that are flagged in another country. So it doesn't matter if it's a vessel flagged in another country, if, it's with, if they're within your EEZ and they're fishing, then you can, you can regulate them. Okay, let's look at regulation of marine pollution under UNCLOS, um, especially from land-based sources. So uh, UNCLOS uh, does have protection of the marine environment generally, including from land-based sources. So around the world, there's a, a growing number of dead zones. So particularly along the east coast of the US and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in northern parts of Europe, and increasingly around China, Japan, and Korea. So essentially, they're caused by large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus um, coming from agriculture, particularly in river systems where there's major agricultural development. So the nitrogen and phosphorus, the nutrients, uh, allow for massive amount of algae to grow when the, those nutrients get out into the ocean. And the algae, when it dies, settles down to the bottom. And if it's you know, large enough, um, when the, the algae breaks down, it causes the water to be, all the oxygen to be used up in the decomposition of the algae, and you end up with dead zones. Um, and if those rise up to the surface, they can basically kill everything. So deoxygenated water, but caused by um, pollution of, through nutrients from land sources. So here's a sort of diagram showing it. So fresh water with uh, nutrients in it coming in, an algal bloom, the dead algae going to the bottom and then when those break down uh, creates an oxygen deprived um, layer and everything dies in that, so all the fish. So these are extensive in these areas, you know, they're, they're massive river systems with huge amounts of agriculture in them. So here's a really uh, visual illustration of it with the um, uh, dirty water uh, coming up from the Mississippi laden with sediments, organic material, nutrients and pesticides. It's coming into the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, there's been in recent decades routine sort of major fish kills in the area. Um, so the Mississippi River mouth comes out. So the Mississippi drains, you know, an enormous part of uh, the continent. Uh, so 
all the way down from the Great Lakes um, all the way up to Alberta and down. So an enormous river system, a huge amount of agriculture in it. And here's some satellite images showing red and oranges representing high concentrations of phytoplankton and river sediment along the coast. And then in winter. So um, I've been following this for many years, but I just updated the slides for the purposes of you know, talking to you today. And this was from, so this has been going on for decades, but just looking at this year, 12th of June this year, um, the um, NOAA forecast uh, very large dead zones for the Gulf of Mexico, um, low oxygen, you know, if based on high rainfall and the like, um, bringing in a lot of sediment. So it didn't get as bad as NOAA had predicted, but it was still really bad. So here's some data of, so the red are areas with very, very low oxygen, so basically deoxygenated. And you're looking at like an enormous, you know, that's, you can see the scale down here, 50 miles. So, you know, you're looking at something like 500 miles, is it? Four or 500 miles across there. So, you know, six or 700 kilometres of ocean that's basically deoxygenated, so everything dying in it. So it's a huge problem. Um, and here's just a graph showing since 1985 these areas affected by very low oxygen levels. And you can see there the largest was in 2017. Uh, and there's no real clear trend there in terms of it improving. So it's a huge management problem for the US. And so where does the nutrients come from? So um, the green is corn and soybeans. Um, the orange is other crops. The brown is pasture and range. So phosphorus and nitrogen, you know, coming from those two different sources. So um, yeah, here's another diagram. All those nutrients coming in from farming practices in the catchment. And yeah, once they're in the river, it's basically impossible to get them out. So you've got to manage them at source and manage the application of fertilizers. And then there's the whole politics of managing farmers. You know, we've got the same here in Australia and the US, um, the, the politics of managing farmers and, you know, growing things. So anyway, UNCLOS, if we look at UNCLOS, um, part 12 deals with the protection and preservation of the marine environment. There is a general obligation in Article 192 to protect and preserve the marine environment and that they should take all measures consistent with the convention, convention necessary to prevent, reduce and control pollution of the marine environment from any source using for this purpose the best available means at their disposal and in accordance with their capabilities. So any source would include ships but ships are generally re regulated under the sort of MARPOL marine pollution framework. UNCLOS more applies to land source pollution, but also uh, things like um, drilling platforms. So Article 194 goes on that the measures that they, they'll use to control it include you know, release of toxic, harmful, noxious substances, et cetera, pollution from vessels. So again, that does cover ships, um, but MARPOL tends to get more bite from that and pollutions from insulations and devices used in exploration and exploitation of the natural resources so something like the deep water horizon could also be regulated under UNCLOS. So article 207 deals with pollution from land based sources so basically control them set up rules and the like and pollution from seabed activities subject to national jurisdiction again um, the deep water horizon would be you know, captured by this. Obviously, the US is not, hasn't ratified uh, UNCLOS, so it's not technically subject to these uh, laws. Um, pollution by dumping, preventing dumping. Um, pollution from vessels, 211. Just as another example, moving away from the US, so basic bottom line, uh, land source pollution is a massive issue in many countries, US and the Mississippi is one really uh, major example. China um, has uh, also similar problems with uh, major pollution from its agricultural areas. Um, in Germany, the Rhine River is a different example, and this is more a success story. So the Rhine River flows from Switzerland, uh, through France, uh, through Germany, and um, enters um, the 
ocean in the Netherlands, so massive river in Europe, the Rhine. And it was heavily industrialized um, for the last century. So that's just a, here's a, the Ruhr Harbour on the Rhine. So just as examples of the you know, large industrialization of it. In 1986, there was a massive disaster uh, in Switzerland, the Sandos disaster, and basically a storehouse of pesticide solvents and dyes caught on fire. And that was bad enough, but in putting out the fire, the fire departments poured a whole heap of um, material and water on the fire, and all of the chemicals then washed into the stormwater system, and there was a massive plume of basically toxic materials went down the Rhine from that disaster and basically just killed everything in it. And yeah, just huge environmental disaster. Again, 1986, so you know, around the time of the ozone hole being you know, addressed, this heightened uh, environmental, in, environmental concerns, you can see why you know, Europe would be horrified by that event. So it led to, though, uh, a really um, positive step, the Rhine Action Program of 1987. So in response, you can see the, it's a disaster dri driven response. In responding to the Sandos disaster, they came up with the Rhine Action Program of 1987. It's sometimes known as Salmon 2000 because its stated target was to see the return of salmon to the Rhine by the year 2000. So uh, it actually achieved that and salmon known for their sensitivity to pollution returned to the Rhine in 1997. So, uh, and there's a program to make the Rhine clean enough to swim in. I tried, in preparing for this lecture, I tried to look for whether they'd been successful or not, and I wasn't able to find out some recent data on whether, whether they're actually achieving that. Uh, obviously, Germany is putting a huge amount into pick, fixing up environmental pollution and the like, so I'd expect that they, if they're not going to reach it by 2020, it would be... Um, a very advanced program. So that's a relative success story in terms of dealing with pollution in rivers. Okay, so that's land source pollution. Uh, I just wanted to mention deep sea mining um, outside of EZs. So even though I'm talking about outside EZs, the example that I'd use is actually comes from PNG within EZs, but um, I just wanted to flag that there's this term, as I said before, area, means the seabed and ocean floor and subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. So basically the deep seabed, it's called the area, I wish it was just called the deep seabed, but in part 11 of UNCLOS it deals with the management of the area and puts deep sea mining under the control of an authority established under UNCLOS. And those, have, those areas have been historically very difficult to mine, but there's been a lot of interest in the last decade or so because um, along sort of the continental plates, uh, there are a lot of um, activity, uh, activities around um, very high concentrations of metals. So they come from hydrothermal vents and um, can result in very high concentrations of things like gold or copper. So if you can mine them, then they're potentially very lucrative sources of those heavy metals. And yeah, there's a whole heap of chemistry going on there, um, you know, the temperatures, the pressure, and why things deposit. Um, but with the increasing ability to use robotics um, at deep, you know, these depths, it's increasingly opening up the deep seabed to potential mining. So an example of that seabed mining is in Papua New Guinea, the Sawara project. So within the Bismarck Sea, um, which is all within the um, PNG EZ, but deep and essentially they're using um, robotics where you know, go down and basically mine along the seafloor to recover those metals. So um, the project's had a you know, hit and miss. Um, it's been very expensive wouldn't say anything's been outrageously successful, but this is an area in terms of you know, future development. Deep sea mining certainly is an area that we're likely to see more development in as you know, automation. You don't need people. You can send down something that can be controlled robotically, and then you know, it's a lot safer and potentially mine those sorts of areas. So I just mentioned that. 
Um, I wanted to just turn to fisheries management briefly. So fisheries management under UNCLOS, uh, the main thing to be aware of is within the EEZ, UNCLOS is very strong. And outside the EEZ, on the high seas, UNCLOS is really weak. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you about the pressures on fish stocks globally. Uh, here's a series of pictures just to illustrate um, some fisheries stocks that are heavily impacted. This is um, a good visual one because these were uh, the winners of a fishing contest um, held annually uh, at Key West in Florida. And the winners in 1957 are at the top. The um, winners in the early 1980s and then 2007. And you notice the winners at the top were massive. And look at the winners in 2007. They're like these minnows that back in 1957 they would have thrown back. It's just too small and basically used them as bait. Someone pointed out to me a few years ago that um, you still would get big gropers, but they're fully protected within. So some of the fish that were caught back in 1957, you've still got big fish like that around, but they're fully protected in that area. So it's not quite as simple as these pictures make out, but there's a big change in the sizes that are winning that contest. And yeah, so that's 1957. This is the early 1980s, and this is 2007. So um, when we're thinking about fisheries as well, it's, it's important to be aware of the shifting baseline syndrome. So people of each generation perceive the state of ecosystems they encountered in their childhood as normal and natural. So when wildlife is depleted or pollution occurs, um, we might notice the loss, but we're unaware that the baselines by which we judge the decline is in fact a state of extreme depletion. So basically, if you know, when you were born, there were very few trees and birds in the area you live, uh, you um, assume that that's, you know, you, you come to think that that's how the world is, and y you don't recognize that actually there's a, there's a shifted baseline, you know, it, a few years before you or a generation before there was extensive trees and birds, those things are gone. What you accept or what you assume to be normal is in fact a very depleted environment and that is a common issue to be aware of with fisheries um, but also pollution generally, a lot of environment degradation. You know what we grew up with we accept as normal and you have to think back to what came before us if we're thinking about how depleted is the environment. So shifting baseline syndrome, um, yeah, it's particularly talked about in fisheries scientists. It came from an article in 1995 by Daniel Pauly about anecdotes in the shifting baseline syndrome of fisheries and the fisheries ecologists. A famous example of a fisheries collapse is the Atlantic cod. So that was distributed north of Europe and on the east coast of the US. And you can see here the collapse of the stock. Um, it was fished from the 1850s and then in the 1860s with industrial um, fishing techniques and the ability to go much deeper. They started fishing the, basically the, the stock that was where the recruitment was coming from. So for a while there was a spike, but then it led to an, a collapse. So yeah, from the late 1950s, offshore bottom trawlers began exploiting the deeper parts of the stock leading to a large catch increase and a strong decline in the underlying biomass. Internationally agreed quotas in the early 1970s and the following declaration um, by Canada of an EEZ in 1977 failed to arrest and reverse the decline. So that's a famous fisheries collapse. And yeah, this is an article from a couple of years ago showing the um, utterly massive imprint of fishing on the world's oceans. So this is um, yeah, data of fishing activities by vessels broadcasting um, a fishing, uh, basically a, vic a vessel location device. So you can see, you know, massive activity. And particularly um, China now has got an enormous fleet. So this is the top 15 fishing nations as at 2016 and China's down the bottom. Uh, it dwarfs everyone else, so millions of hours of fishing in 2016. So China has an enormous fleet, now no, not in any way confined to sort of Chinese coastal waters, but going around the globe to South America, massive, massive fleet. So the global 
um, capture of fisheries and aquaculture production since 1950 is shown in this graph, so a lot of aquaculture activity, but the actual capture really hasn't increased substantially since about 1985, but we are going further and basically exploiting stocks that are, you know, to depletion. So as we deplete a stock, we then move on. So we're able to sustain essentially the same catch, but by depleting more and more stocks. So obviously at some point we run out of new stocks to deplete and then, uh, yeah. So the global trends in the state of the world's marine stocks is shown in this um, report from 2018. So yeah, underfish stocks in, since 1975 going through to 2015, um, overfish stocks have substantially increased. Um, so yeah, overfishing is a global problem. So under UNCLOS, as I've said, there's strong powers to regulate. You don't necessarily do it well, but you've got power as a national government to regulate within your EEZ. Um, and yeah, coastal states shall determine the allowable catch of the living resources within its EEZ. So that's powerful. There's a lot of, yeah, lot of power in Article 61 for coastal states to regulate appropriately. I won't go into the details. Um, optimal utilisation of marine resources within CEZ is the objective. And then, uh, yeah, licensing and all of those things. So within the EZ, it's strong. Um, allows for enforcement of vessels and those sorts of things, detention of vessels. Can I just give you an example of, uh, of uh, an arrest within an EEZ? So this is a case of enforcement of fisheries laws in Australia's EEZ. Um, it involved, it's called the Volga case, it led to a range of litigation. Uh, and, and again, I emphasise to be effective, international law has to be enforced through national laws. So Australia has claimed an EEZ, created an Australian fishing zone and can regulate it, but for remote areas, it's really hard to enforce these laws. So Australia, in this case, sent a naval vessel down because the area where the illegal fishing was occurring was in a sub antarctic islands, the Heard and McDonald's Islands, which are about 4,000 kilometres southwest of Perth, so really remote. And the islands, the vessel was arrested just outside Australia's EZ. Um, so that was the location where it was boarded. And you can see their herd island, uh, and you can see the EZ. Why, does it, why is it shaped that way? Yep. Yep. Any guesses who the Kugula Islands might belong to? Close, France. Yep, so they're French islands. And so the EZ is split between the two. And yeah, that's Heard Island. So remote, um, covered in snow and ice. There's an old weather station. No one lives on it now. So this is Australian naval personnel boarding from the HMS Canberra. So basically what happened, there were two Russian vessels fishing within the Australian fishing zone. Um, an Australian vessel alerted Australian authorities to it and the HMS Canberra was dispatched, sailed down. It then arrested the Lena within Australian waters and the Lena obviously radioed to the Volga to um, get out of um, Australia's EEZ because under the UNCLOS system, uh, you can't arrest, you can arrest a vessel of another nation, flagged to another nation, if it's within your EEZ and they're violating your fishing laws, but as soon as they get outside your EEZ, you can't arrest them unless you've commenced, and I'm not joking, the term is commenced hot pursuit, which sounds like something out of, when I was a kid, there was this show called The Dukes of Hazard, um, and it sort of reminds me of that, hot pursuit. I'm in hot pursuit, little daddy. Um, anyway, that's the term under UNCLOS, it's hot pursuit. If you commence hot pursuit within the EZ, you can pursue them outside your EZ and arrest them. But you have to commence um, hot pursuit um, by visual or sound. You can't radio them, you can't just see them on a radar and like chase after them. You actually have to be able to see them and signal them. So that Canberra was arresting the Lena within the EZ. This vessel is trying to get across the EZ 
the Canberra sent a helicopter after it, which caught up to it, and it then stopped, and then the camera caught up to it, but it didn't catch up to it until after it was outside the EZ. And it, the story goes that the, the HMS Canberra, you know, radioed Canberra, our national capital, as to whether, you know, they should proceed with the arrest or not, and were told to proceed with it. So Australia was breaching international law because it actually hadn't commenced hot pursuit um, within it. This is, here's a picture of the helicopters above the vessel. Actually, is that above the vessel? Uh, and then here's the naval crew coming onto it. I'm just going to play you. So I got really interested in this case. Uh, it led to a whole range of litigation. I've got a case study on my website. But I asked the Navy for any pictures related to it. And this uh, guy who was, happened to be in charge of the press who dealt with my request happened to be one of the officers involved in the whole operation. And he sent me this video file. So this is the um, footage. The, the sound is terrible. This was taken from the Australian helicopter um, after it had caught up to the Volga. So it's out, they're outside the EZ and they are yeah, basically circling it. And so they kept circling it and the camera caught up. So I'm just going to drag it a bit forward. Oops. I think I have to play it to be able to drag things through it. So here's the Volga, and then when the so when the Canberra caught up, so they didn't board it. So they, there's this helicopter circling it. They didn't board it. They waited for the Canberra to catch up. Why do you think they did that? It's a military helicopter, no doubt they're armed. Well, you're a lot less likely to get <laughs> any opposition when there is a naval vessel just um, in sight as well. So they basically let the Canberra catch up. The helicopter went back to the Canberra. This is the boarding party being briefed, ready to go. I'll just play a little bit of it. And then basically the footage cuts to the helicopter with the boarding party on it flying across to the um, Volga and then them boarding and they rappel down these ropes called, called fast roping. Uh, and then there's some footage on the Volga. So this was all just footage that was obviously being filmed by the Navy for potential use in evidence um, in court cases. So here they are all ready to go. They've been briefed on what to do. Whoops. Here they are going out, getting on the helicopter. Then they fly off. So this is now being filmed from the camera. Oh, I'll just back this up. So here you are, the helicopter's above the Volga. It stopped, basically. And they throw out a rope, and then uh, basically you grab onto it with gloves. It's a big, thick rope, and they just um, rappel down it. But look here, do you notice there's a problem with where he is? And then he stops, and you see like a little arm come out, and he sees, it, I reckon he's saying, over there, you bloody idiot. Yeah, dumb, come on, get down in the middle of the ocean. Over there. So the, cat, the helicopter moves across a bit, and then he keeps going. So more naval personnel come on board. Here's, again, so here's, this is from the warship. So, you know, good to, if you're going to board a ship in, in the open sea to have an, another naval ship right beside you. Then they're sending across another boarding party in a small vessel. There's the crew assembled. This is the fast roping, so they're getting out. So he grabs on and slides down the rope. And it's looking up at the helicopter. Now this is um, this is 
uh, a naval officer in grey, and then the guy in blue is a um, uh, officer of the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, so who were travelling with the navy, and so basically they went on to the um, bridge of the Volga, and uh, the captain presented them with a log that they claimed, the Volga claimed that they were just um, passing through the Australian fishing zone and they hadn't been doing any fishing, that it was just innocent passage. So you've got a right of innocent passage. It, they claimed they weren't fishing. Uh, and they even presented them with a log book that showed that they hadn't been doing any fishing. But the Navy was able to download their actual electronic um, records and it showed that basically for the two weeks leading up to the arrest, they'd been fishing extensively all around within the Australian fishing zone, but essentially they had a false log prepared. And then in terms of their claims that they weren't... Um, so this is down in the hold. So the Patagonian toothfish was what, what they were after. So basically this is all what, what was used in evidence. Um, but they went down and on the... So the ship had claimed that they, they weren't fishing in the Australian fishing zone, but they went down and onto the, um, the decks where the lines come in because they put lines out with hooks on them. And they went down and the lines that had all just been recently pulled up were wet. There were fish still attached to them. When they opened the gills, the fish still bled. So the fish were very freshly caught. So there was a whole heap of evidence that the vessel had been fishing within the Australian fishing zone. So even though Australia arrested it unlawfully under UNCLOS, yep? Is there a key thing of saying logbooks and they were actually logging it electronically? Why were they doing that? Like, to, to why were they doing it for their own... Uh, I think, as I understand it, because it was explained in one of the court judgments about it, all this background of facts, as I understand it, like there was a physical paper copy of the logbook, but then there was also the, you know, like if the police got your phone and they looked at, you know, all your search history or something, like things that I wouldn't even know how to do or delete, um, you know, they can look back through that history. So I think it was just the computer IT people were able to access things that the Russian crew hadn't, you know, manipulated. I think that that was it. Uh, yeah, other questions? Right of safe passage, yeah, or innocent passage. Innocent passage, is that just through the um, EEZ or is that in like the Yeah, so the right of innocent passage is one of the important um, sort of protections of, under UNCLOS. So, yeah, vessels can sail through waters. Um, that's why when you get in like to the contiguous zone, in terms of the right to board for c checking customs and those sorts of things, that's when you get you know, they can be boarded to check for those sorts of things. But yeah, if a vessel is simply sailing through your waters, you're generally required to let it go. Um, so, well, you can board it to check. You have a right to go in and inspect it. But if they're not doing anything wrong, then you just let them go. Yeah, but here they weren't, <laughs> they were, it wasn't innocent. So they put an um, Australian crew on it, they arrested the crew, and they took them back to, they sailed back to... Yeah, these are some of the fishing lines and the like. This is the vessels getting back to Perth. Anyway, so, bit of footage, uh, a real arrest, uh, and what I really want to emphasise is the difficulty of enforcing fisheries laws in remote areas is really, it's really hard. Um, and so that's within a national EZ, but in a remote area. If they're outside that, then they, wouldn't, they would have been just subject to uh, you know, the laws of their flag, which was Russia. So Russia challenged Australia, because Australia arrested the vessels and then refused to let them go. Um, and Russia brought an action uh, first, well, there was an, a litigation in the Federal Court of Australia about the forfeiture of the vessels and then also one in ITLOS, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which um, Russia won. But, yeah, 
Don't need to go into the details of it, but uh, that's an example. It's a case study on my website if you want to go and have a look at them. But International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is another international tribunal created under UNCLOS. And here's that court. So yeah, the, it lost judgment in the Volga case. So yeah, UNCLOS provides strong protections within the EZs, but outside of EZs and the high seas, it's really weak. And just as an example of that, so we were looking a moment ago at the long and detailed provisions for fishing controls within the EZs. If you go to the high seas provisions, it basically is almost blank. It's not quite. You know, there's Article 86, um, but it's, yeah, freedom of the, it's basically about freedom of the high seas, not a really about control. So on the high seas, generally vessels are subject to control of um, the country that they're registered in, the flag, the flag state. So conservation and management is really hard. There's basically a right to use the high seas. Um, there's been many pushes to try and improve and have a, you know, another version of UNCLOS that deals with fishing on the high seas. Um, this was just a, a little bit from a few years ago about preparatory committee established by the UN General Assembly to, to look at the development of an in, uh, international legally binding instrument under UNCLOS on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, that is on the high seas, that's still you know, being pushed along. But there's many countries that don't want that. So you know, if you, uh, I suspect particularly China, um, because essentially it's exploiting those resources uh, and doesn't want controls on it. So, yeah. I, wa I won't go into the details of port state, those sorts of things. I want to turn then to look at um, uh, an example of fisheries management on the high seas. I notice it's three o'clock. Do you want to take a five minute break, get up and stretch your legs? There's probably about 20 minutes on um, conservation of southern bluefin tuna. And then um, I think we'll finish early this afternoon. Um, so I don't want to go any further than really just to give you an overview of these important topics. Um, but it's, I think, also good to take a break. So shall we say, by my watch, it's five past. Shall we take 10 minutes and come back at quarter past? So welcome back to our lecture on UNCLOS. Before the break, we were talking about uh, fisheries and I wanted to, we made the point that UNCLOS is strong within maritime zones, but outside on the high seas, it's, it's really weak. I wanted to look at a couple of examples, uh, particularly this one of agreed high sea fisheries regimes outside of UNCLOS. So there's many sort of regional or fishery specific agreements like this. Um, the Convention on the Conservation of the Southern Bluefin Tuna, 1994, is the convention that I wanted to look at. And particularly, it's particularly significant for Australia and Japan, because they're the two countries that mainly fish for Southern Bluefin Tuna. So this is a Southern Bluefin Tuna, uh, or many of them in a school. Um, they're an amazing fish, uh, incredible predator, swim very fast. They're distributed basically in the Southern Ocean, hence the name, the Southern Bluefin Tuna. And uh, they spawn uh, between Western Australia and Indonesia. So you can see on that map the spawning grounds. That's for the entire global population. That's where they spawn. Then the young Southern Bluefin Tuna move away from the spawning grounds and follow the currents down the west coast of Australia. And then uh, they'll often um, basically move along the southern coast of Australia. So an older southern bluefin tuna move away and out of the Australian fishing zone. So you can see them moving through the Australian fishing zone there. So uh, they were caught a lot with poles and, sorry, long lines. Uh, and then 
a, a method that's been developed in recent decades is to basically run a net around a school of uh, tuna, uh, trap them, and then take the net back and put it in um, a secluded bay like this and basically feed them up within the net and then when they're big enough and fat enough you then harvest them and <laughs> you might have seen um, some stories about those sorts of nets a they cause you know the significant issues with pollution aquaculture in those sorts of areas but um, other thing is sharks really like to <laughs> come in because <laughs> if the shark can get in there then it's you know it's a great feeding feeding time you've got all of these big fish <laughs> and they're trapped so anyway uh, when the fish are killed, uh, the biggest market in the world is undoubtedly Japan. So here's tuna that have obviously been frozen and gutted, gutted and then frozen. Uh, and they're incredibly expensive. So this is uh, from 2013. The owner of a popular sushi restaurant chain paid a then record price of 155 million yen, 1.7 million Australian dollars for a um, well, that's $7,600 a kilogram for a 228 kilogram bluefin tuna uh, at this wholesale fish market. Apparently, at the first sale of the year or something, there's a lot of prestige around being the... the so it's like a PR exercise to bid for these outrageous prices. So tuna don't normally sell for that. It's, it's just a PR stunt at the beginning of um, the markets. So... Uh, and then this was another picture from last year of the same fellow um, with that uh, sushi zamai restaurant chain um, preparing to cut a 278 kilo kilogram bluefin tuna that was bought for a new record of 333.6 million yen or 4.3 million dollars for a fish. I mean, it is a big, <laughs> it is a big fish, but that's a lot of money for a fish. Um, so, and. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, with the huge fishing effort, uh, the biomass of southern bluefin tuna has declined since the 1960s to about 10% now of what it originally was. So here is a graph which I took from um, a scientific report from the Secretariat's website, um, the reports from the 7th of September this year. And it shows reported southern bluefin tuna catches by flag from 1952 to 2018. So I'm sure the original version is in colour, but for some reason when they put it in the report on their online. But Japan is the shown there in Australia, and then there's a range of other countries, but they're negligible. It's Japan and Australia are the two biggest fishing countries. And you can see there was huge fishing by Jap Japanese fleet in the 60s particularly, and then the fish stock um, collapsed um, in the 80s to the point in the um, 90s when it was down to about 20% or 10%, I think. So here's um, reports on the um, catches. So they move around through the Southern Ocean in different years. And uh, routinely, you'll see news reports that when the the um, parties would meet each year to decide on annual quotas. It was often reported in the Australian news because it was a significant fishery for Australia and the fights over it because the huge problem facing the parties to it is how much catch should they allow and how they should allocate the allowable catch. So the object of the... So, you know, let's skip over the preamble. We've got a problem. This is an important fishery and it's in danger of collapsing. Then some of the... Um, obligations. Article 3, the object of the convention is to ensure through appropriate management the conservation optimum utilisation of the southern bluefin tuna. And then Article 6, the parties establish, agree, sorry, establish and agree to maintain the commission for the conservation of the southern bluefin tuna, here and after called the commission. So that's effectively the meaning of the parties. They come together, they each have one vote. Each party shall have one vote in the commission. Decisions of the commission shall be taken to, by unanimous vote of the parties present at the commission meeting. So a conference of the parties, yep, but a different name for it. Article 8, for the conservation management and optimum utilisation of the southern bluefin tuna, the commission shall decide upon the total allowable catch allocated between the parties. So you can go onto their website, really interesting website with a lot of 
background to Southern Bluefish Tuna. The scientific reports are posted there, so a huge amount of information if you're interested in fisheries. And this is some of the things you'll find in the reports. So here's a um, graph showing the spawning biomass in thousands of tons, um, and basically the collapse in the 60s and 70s and 80s down to around about 10 percent of the original biomass. So here's, so they model depending on, this was essentially a model based on, uh, it was, so the model was done in 2009, okay, so you've got the orange line showing the actual spawning stock biomass in um, thousands of tons and the um, the MT doesn't stand for millions of tons. I think it stands for metric tons. So just I just ignore the M. It's just a ton. Uh, so um, yeah, MT or MT is a US abbreviation for metric ton, an alternative term for ton, a measurement of equal mass to 1,000 kilograms. So because I remember looking at it and going, million tons? Because I I would normally interpret MT as million tons. I think that's a lot of fish, but it's not. Uh, it's just tons. Uh, anyway. Um, this model was done in 2009 and you can see the um, black line here. So this one is if you basically said no more catches, so zero allowable, total allowable catch. If you did that, then you would expect the population to recover quite quickly. So by 2030, you know, the population would have gone from um, 50,000 tons to 300,000 tons. So rapid, reco relatively rapid recovery. Then the alternative modeled scenario is a catch of 15,000 tons, 15,810. And if you went to that level, the, basically the, you would wipe them out by um, about 15 years and, and obviously if you went higher than that there could be a, a more rapid um, wiping out and in, in between that depending on the amount that you catch the population will either continue to decline or be relatively stable or just start to recover so can anyone guess in that year what they set as the total allowable catch so this is the countries trying to agree on this very, very lucrative um, fishery, what do you think they agreed would be the total allowable catch based on these models? It was basically in the middle, about 11,000, um, which is just one of these just slightly recovering but very slowly pretty well status quo. So we're going to keep it at about 10% because we can't agree to not be greedy or we can't agree to just leave it for a few years to recover. We're going to have a, like, ha let's have a moratorium for five years and just see if the stocks recover. That might be a sensible, in fact, that would be a very sensible fisheries management from a precautionary approach. Because obviously these models, that you know, they're done on the best available science, but they can be wrong. So you still might get a collapse. Anyway, in that, so in that, um, this was the allocated catch, sorry, the 2009 meeting was the allocated catch. Actually, I might have been wrong with 11,000. Nominal catch, allocated catch was about 9,600. So let's go back. 9,000, so that's a green one. Okay, so it's not quite as bad. But they certainly didn't go to zero. But you can see how they're allocating the catch based on the science and they're trying to get a recovery. And yeah, so basically optimal utilization, catch limits, they allocate it. And then um, I looked at it just um, last night just to update for, for us. And the most recent as it last night the total catch has been slightly increased. So from 2015, it was 12,000 tonnes, 14,000 tonnes in 2016, and then 2018 was 17,000 tonnes. So the 
slowly increasing the catch. So there's similar issues for other tuna fisheries. Um, so the Pacific tuna stocks um, have been reported to be on the brink of disaster. Um, so there's this fantastic show called Palau, Take the Long Line. Has anyone been to Palau? It's lucky enough. So Palau is an amazing country um, east of Japan and um, Korea, um, island country. Anyway, this report um, was an ABC, it's available in ABC Ivy, you can go on to the link if you want it, but it's a really interesting report about, this was an interview um, with the um, president of Palau at the time, and he said, Palau is so fragile and so beautiful, you just have to take the responsible action and minimise the risk that would destroy all of this for our children and our future children. So you know, the essence there of sustainable development, uh, pr the precautionary approach, intergenerational equity, all wrapped up in that statement. And in the documentary, it explained how uh, the Australian government had donated a uh, patrol boat to Palau to assist it with basically fisheries management because Palau was being hammered by illegal fishing, particularly from um, Korean um, vessels, as I understand it, possibly Chinese uh, as well. But high-tech vessels that are coming in with high speed, you know, really good sonar, really good um, equipment, and um, fisheries, you know, fisheries technology is continuing to increase. And so these high speed vessels come in. Australia donated a patrol vessel to them. It had an Australian captain, and then it also had um, crew members from Palau on it. But uh, essentially, this was one of the images they showed in the documentary with Palau Islands there, and then it showed essentially they could sh they could see all these vessels, but as soon as the patrol boat went out of port, there'd be people on a phone saying, hey, the patrol boat's coming out, you better skedaddle, and all of the vessels would just basically move away from it. So they could never catch, it. well, I say never, but basically the vessels would just all move out of the EZ so they couldn't be arrested by Palau, the Palau um, vessels. So this small Pacific country basically was facing this onslaught from illegal fishing and it basically couldn't regulate it. So the Convention for the Conservation and Management of Highly Migratory Fish Stocks in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, 2000, that was in that particular program they were talking about that and the need to Im improve it. Um, that's a map of the area that's covered by it, so all of that, so Palau is Palau, I think. I thought it was higher than that, but is that Palau? No, it's that's what it's marked as on the map anyway. I thought it was a little bit higher than that, near, um, more east of Japan. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the convention area, and all of these small Pacific countries are all facing those same sorts of tremendous challenges from uh, really high-tech vessels coming from. Um, you know, China, South Korea, um, Malaysia, and coming across and basically fishing in their EEZs and they're unable to regulate them. So UNCLOS gives them the power to regulate, but then you've actually got to enforce those laws. And the high-tech nature of the illegal fishing activity makes it incredibly difficult, um, even just prohibitively expensive for those countries. So, yeah. Um, I don't need to go into that convention. You get the idea. There's um, close relationship with, between those sorts of conventions, UNCLOS and, uh, and others, like um, the Western Conservation Pacific. Um, you know, they're interrelated, but yeah. Probably t talked about this topic already, but I just wanted to perch on it for a moment. So. Managing fisheries both inside and outside of national waters on the high seas is hard. Um, even inside um, your national waters, it's still typically remote areas. You know, even though you might be able to see a vessel on the radar, you actually physically got to get another vessel there to arrest them. Um, that's expensive, uh, and you know, if they're equipped with radar as well, they just move away. So they come just inside your national waters, um, fish, 
and then skedaddle back across outside your EZ before you can get there. Um, so, and then outside of national waters and the high seas, it even gets harder because you can't regulate them, you know? And so they can just basically have a flag of convenience. So a country that, so a flag of convenience is the common term used for countries that basically will register a vessel and then have very low standards for either um, uh, wages and staff conditions uh, as well as environmental standards. So the, the big one where the vast bulk of ships are registered now is Panama uh, and it's because it's so much cheaper to have a vessel registered in Panama because you don't then have to meet the wages and standards required for staff if you're registered in the US for instance it's really expensive to basically pay your crew. So having the same vessel registered in Panama is a lot cheaper to operate it. So those flags of convenience, same for fisheries, um, much lower standards. So it's really hard to manage those things and there's no simple answer for it. So, yeah, that was that foreign correspondent. Um, your thoughts on that? Has anyone worked in fisheries? So I suppose the key thing I want to keep hammering home is there's, you know, there's this gap between what might be said on paper in terms of UNCLOS, that you know, you've got a right to manage it, you've then actually got to implement it on the ground and there are all of these practical difficulties with implementing it on the ground or in the ocean uh, to achieve um, you know, you know, good sound management of resources and you know there's gaps in the international regime like the huge gap for high seas fisheries but even in the areas that are relatively comprehensively addressed like management within maritime zones it's still really hard and expensive and difficult so let's wrap up uh, on unclos so unclos it's such an important regime i really want you to um, be aware of the key maritime zones and the exclusive economic zone, 200 nautical miles, countries can control um, fisheries within that zone. Really, really important. Uh, the other aspects we dealt with aren't as important as that. That's the main one I really want you to be aware of. And then I've just looked at a couple of other conventions on southern bluefin tuna and the like to talk about some of the other regimes dealing with fisheries but it's a very, very difficult area. We face, globally, we face incredible pressure on fishing stocks. There isn't a effective regime in place at the moment. And it's, it's hard to see how we will get one in place because we still face the same problem that was faced back in the Bering Fur Seal arbitration where those countries, you know, they, they agreed on a stronger regime, but then the vessels just left and went to be registered in another country. So any comprehensive regime that we agree globally would still face the problem of the laggards, the countries that didn't join up, and then you know fishing vessels going and registering with them. And then it's really difficult to enforce the regime against those countries. So very hard. OK, in summary, key points. International law of the sea has evolved significantly over the past century and it's important to understand this background. UNCLOS is a very important uh, framework establishing national jurisdiction over adjacent maritime zones, but there are important ongoing disputes in some areas linked to control of resources such as the Senkaku Islands or the South China Sea. Uh, third, coastal states can control fisheries and resource ex extractions within their EEZ and this is a particularly important zone. Fourth. Enforcement of fisheries laws remains difficult, particularly in remote areas. And fifth, management of fisheries outside of national waters on the high seas remains very difficult and there are many inter international conventions dealing with specific fisheries such as the uh, Convention on the Conservation of the Southern Bluefin Tuna. Okay, in terms of further reading, that Palau documentary, um, I'll put the link up on the website. I, I, I found it really interesting and, and if you're interested in sort of the pressures facing South Pacific, um, that's a great documentary to watch, still very relevant. Um, there's the UNCLOS homepage, the Southern Bluefin Tuna website is also filled with information. Okay, so that's 
UNCLOS. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Shall we take, so we took a break. Um, why don't we take a five minute break and we'll start our, come back at quarter two and we'll dive into, so we're moving from more content to looking at uh, a workshop on policy recommendations and talking about frameworks for you to think about. Uh, so should we take five minutes? Okay, so let's come back at well, a little bit more than five minutes at quarter to four, and um, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll then leave, um, you know, before five o'clock from that workshop. Cool.